أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين شفيع المذنبين وحبيب قلوب الصادقين سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الأطيبين الأطهرين الهداة المهديين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأهل لقطة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد Your brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today, inshallah, we have those of us who are going to be able to, whether here or at our own homes, inshallah, we will spend as much of the night as possible in worship, in prayer, remembering our fellow believers, our fellow members of the human family, wherever they may be in the world, those of our believers, our family members, our loved ones who have gone before us and are no longer with us, with our prayers, with our thoughts. It is an important night, and I don't want to take time away from that with my words, but I will try to very briefly uh, continue our talks on the conversations with God that have been quoted or encouraged within the Qur'an. Today I would like to take a look at some verses of Surah An-Naml. This is Surah number 27. And these verses, they describe the prayer of the Prophet Sulaiman, Prophet Solomon. And before I discuss the actual words and the prayer, a little bit of an introduction is in order. The Qur'an mentions something miraculous about the reality of the kingdom that God gave to Prophet Sulaiman. And that miraculous aspect of this divine authority, this kingdom that was given to Sulaiman is something that for those of us who look at things with a material eye, even if we believe in God and we believe in the hereafter, it might seem a little bit fantastical and it might seem a little bit like a fairy tale. But the Qur'an emphasizes that Sulaiman, he was given not just a kingdom where he ruled over people, but that he even had some authority over the physical world itself. And he had a means of communicating with the animal kingdom. And the Qur'an does not give extra messages. This is an important point in tafsir and in understanding the verses of Qur'an throughout the, the, the book. In Surah Al-Kahf, Allah mentions that with regard to the youths who were known as the sleepers in the cave, it mentions the controversy. People say they were three, they were five, they were seven, they were more, they were less, this, that. But the Qur'an, it mentions the controversy in several verses, it doesn't give the answer. How many were there? It would have been far shorter and far more concise for Allah to answer the controversy than to mention the controversy in depth and say, I'm not going to tell you the answer. And the Qur'an does that time and time again, because it wants to tell us that if something is not relevant to your guidance, then in the time of the Prophet, it might have been the Jews and the Christians, and after the Prophet, it would be the Muslims who will argue back and forth about the details of the historical facts, but that takes away from the actual point of the story. So the Qur'an does this, but then certain times it actually gives us certain details. When the Qur'an gives us details, that tells us that in the view of the Qur'an, in the eyes of Allah who revealed the Qur'an, those details are important for our guidance. And in the case of Prophet Sulaiman, we have this instruction that the kingdom which Allah gave to Sulaiman, it extended beyond simply the outer realm. And so that is an important thing for Muslims to recognize. We shouldn't say that, well, the communication that Allah has with his prophets or with humanity is simply a matter of telling us what we should do and what we shouldn't do, giving us a legal system or an ethical and a moral system, but it also involves giving certain authority over the physical world, miracles and the authority over even the granting of cures to those who are sick, or the performing of other miracles or divine signs, that is something which we should not be surprised 
if a prophet or the successor to a prophet is able to perform. That is the lesson that we have from these verses of the Quran. Allah says in Surah An-Naml, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا دَاوُودَ وَسُلَيْمَانَ عِلْمَ That we gave Dawood and his son Sulaiman, David and Sulaiman, knowledge. وَقَالَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي فَضَّلَنَا عَلَى كَثِيرٍ مِّنْ عِبَادِهِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And they said, Praise be to Allah who gave us virtue over many of his believing servants. وَوَرِثَ سُلَيْمَانُ دَاوُودَ وَقَالَ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ عُلِّمْنَا مَنْ تَقَتَّيْرِ وَأُوْتِينَا مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ إِنَّ هَذَا لَهُوَ الْفَضْلُ الْمُبِينَ Sulaiman, he inherited Dawood, and he said, O people, verily we have been taught the speech and how to communicate with the birds, and we have been given of everything, of all of the blessings of, of God, and verily this is the clear distinction. This is one of the obligations that the prophets had and their successors had is to inform the people of their spiritual rank and what Allah had blessed them with because that is relevant to people being able to follow them and know how to achieve guidance through their means. So the lesson that we have very briefly here is that we should not deny those miracles and that extra rank that Allah gives to His Prophets. And if we go through the Qur'an, how Allah mentions the extended life of Nuh alayhi salam and how he stayed many generations and many centuries among his people. How it mentions that Isa alayhi salam was able to perform miracles and cure people of their sicknesses, even terminal, incurable sicknesses. How he was able to bring people back to life and how he was able to speak from the cradle. Then we can see what lessons these verses contain and how they are relevant even to Islamic history and the rank of the Prophet and the successors of the Prophet in answering objections that people may have. But there is also another point that we have to keep in mind, and this is equally important. The Qur'an mentions these ranks, but one thing that the Qur'an emphasizes is that the miracle of the Prophet of Islam was to be different from the miracles of those previous Prophets. And this is something that sometimes Muslims do get confused in. Just as we also get caught up in those historical details and issues that are not really related to our guidance as the people of old did before Islam, we also sometimes forget the fact that the miracle of Islam and the reason we are to believe in Islam and our model of leadership is really not to be based on miracles and seeking miracles and those who can perform miracles. This is one of the things that Allah mentions the unbelievers would come to the Prophet and say, وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ لَوْ لَا يُكَلِّمُنَ اللَّهُ أَوْ تَأْتِينَ آيَةً Those who don't know, those who don't have knowledge, they say, if only Allah would come and speak to us directly and say, I'm telling you the people of the earth, the people of the Arabian Peninsula, this is the Prophet. أَوْ تَأْتِينَ آيَةً Or if a verse, if a sign from God could come down to us directly, some of the miracles of old, if they could be repeated, if there could be a pestilence in the land, if there could be a divine miracle sent to all of the people like Musa alayhi salam had, like Isa alayhi salam had. Then this would make us very willing to believe. This is the same thing that the people before them said. Their hearts are similar. And Allah, by saying that, He says that it's just an excuse to say that if the miracles were to come as they came for previous religious communities, that we would believe. Their hearts are the same. The previous communities did not believe after the miracles. And they wouldn't either. And this is the money paragraph in the verse. That we have clarified the signs for those who are going to achieve certainty and those who have certainty. The signs are clear. The Prophet, as all Prophets did, and the successors to the Prophet, they did perform miracles. But the basis of our relationship to the Prophet is not to be those miracles. That is why the Prophet and his successors, their miracles were not public. Their public message was the Qur'an, the teachings of the Qur'an, the logic and the beauty of the message they brought. In certain instances where there was a need or an obstacle to people understanding, they then did 
augment their argument with miracles, but that is the exception to the rule. And that's important for us as Muslims. If we are looking to religious guidance and looking to religious leadership, there are some people who under different names, they may call it Sufism, they may call it Irfan or whatever else, they may say that, well, I can perform a miracle. I can do something that you can't explain. I can tell you what you're thinking, or I can tell you what dream you saw, or I can tell you what's in your heart, or what your spiritual ailment is, or all of these other things. That is not the way the Prophet preached to people or introduced Islam to people. That is not the way that the Imams preached to people or introduced Islam to people. I am not denying that those gifts are given by Allah to His Prophets and to the Imams and to certain of His righteous servants. That is something that the Quran clearly emphasizes. But if we are looking for religious guidance and leaderships, leadership, then قَدْ بَيَّنَّ الْآيَاتِ لِقَوْمٍ يُوقِنُونَ The signs have been made clear and indisputable for those who are going to achieve certainty. The signs are these apparent public teachings that the Prophet and the Imams took so much pride in. And Shaykh Allah, was mentioning one of the sermons of Nahj al one point that I would like to make, and I'm sure that perhaps you might have made this point before. These words of the Imams, these sermons of the Prophet, they would take pride in them. When Malik ibn Ashtar went to Egypt, Imam Ali sent with him a letter of guidance. When Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr was sent as the governor of Egypt, Imam Ali sent with him a letter of guidance. When these epistles were stolen after the governors appointed by Amir al-Mu'mineen were killed, those treasures of wisdom came into the possession of Muawiyah. And Amir al-Mu'mineen, Imam Ali, he mourned the loss of those treasures. He said that this is wisdom, divine wisdom, it has fallen into the wrong hands. This is something which is a tragedy for the believers because they will subvert it, they will think, they will tell people this is their wisdom, and they will try to subvert it and misuse it and mislead people with it. So this is what the Imams took pride in. This is the heritage that they bequeathed, and this is what they would mourn when it was lost, what fell into the wrong hands. And all of our Imams, they said to their followers, don't let these pearls of wisdom fall into the wrong hands. How tragic would it be for followers of the Imam and followers of the Prophet to say the Qur'an, well, we don't really have time for that. The ahadith and those pearls of wisdom, that's not something that we can focus on so much. Let's go after those other miracles. Let's find out somebody who can do something that we can't explain. Islam, religion, guidance, and salvation are not a magic trick, and they are not something that we should allow these other means to enter into the way of and become an obstacle to understanding. Islam is a religion of guidance, it is a religion that speaks to our hearts and to our minds, and those miracles, those other forms of augmenting and establishing the message, they are true, but they are not our primary means of relating to our leadership and understanding our mission. I spoke about that in a little bit of depth, because there are some trends that come, and this is something that comes and goes within the Islamic community in every generation, there are these upswings and these downswings and these teachings come and people say that, well, do you know that we can become an arif by reciting this dhikr or we can do it this way? We look for shortcuts and we think that this is a way to demonstrate who has a greater sign of faith and who has a higher degree of belief. None of those are the criteria of iman. And so I will close that chapter. Please recite salawat. Allah. So, the Qur'an, it mentions that Sulaiman he was going with his army and there was in their path, some distance ahead, a colony of ants. And this colony of ants, they saw Sulaiman coming and the queen of that colony, she saw that this army was approaching and she said to her subjects, I guess you would call them, her ants, that go back into your colony, get off the path that they are going to tread because they will trample you. And now the verse describes the reaction of Sulaiman this way. He smiled and broke into a laugh at what this ant had said because he realized he was able to communicate and understand 
what she had said. As I said, don't deny the miracle and don't try to explain it away as some kind of abstract metaphor. It is what it is, and it has a clear meaning. Of course, that word qala in Arabic that is described as the speech of the ant, it has a general meaning. It doesn't necessarily refer to speech by the mouth. You can say qala bi ra'sihi or qala bi yadihi to speak by making an indication. So this might have been whatever means of communication the ants have. So it's, it's a, a form of movement or a fragrance they admit or whatever else it may be. All of that is incorporated within the idea of the ant communicating to her fellow ants. But the idea was communicated. Sulaiman was able to perceive and understand and it was something that made him smile and laugh. Now when we have these kinds of blessings Sometimes we also smile and we laugh, but then we get lost in how great we are. I discovered it. I thought about it. I have been given this blessing by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, material, spiritual, whatever it may be, we get lost. But Sulaiman, he didn't smile thinking, this tells me and everybody how great I am. He said, وَقَالَ رَبِّ أَوْزِعْنِي أَنَشْكُرَ نِعْمَتَكَ الَّتِي أَنَمْتَ عَلَيَّ وَعَدَى وَالِدَيَّ Oh Allah, inspire me to show gratitude for the blessing that you showed upon me and upon my parents. And so that I may do what is salih, what is righteous, such that it will be pleasing to you. And cause me to enter with your mercy among your righteous servants. Now this is the prayer of Sulaiman alayhi salam. Let us just very briefly talk about this prayer and we will come back to it because it is also mentioned in a slightly different context elsewhere in the Qur'an as well, inshallah, if we have time. The prayer of Sulaiman is أَوْزِعْنِي أَنْ أَشْكُرَ نِعْمَتَكَ الَّتِي أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيَّ وَعَلَى وَالِدَيَّ Oh Allah, inspire me to show gratitude for the blessing that you gave to me and to my parents. The first thing that we see is that Sulaiman is asking for inspiration, O Zirni, put something within my heart that gives me inspiration. The good that we are seeking from Allah as our creator is not on the outside. It's not to impress other people with our faith. It's not to seem to be good or even to do good on the outside. But it is that we are asking Allah to have the inspiration within us to have a motivation to do good. So that when we are challenged, when we have a moment that is a test for us, we are able to make the right decision. What we pray for is the inspiration so that goodness comes from within us. That is what the prophets of God would ask for. And he is asking for the inspiration to show gratitude for the blessing that he was given and that his parents were given. Now this blessing that his parents were given, it isn't simply a matter of well, his parents were given a blessing that passed on to him. Because if it was the blessing that was passed on to him, if my parents, if they have wealth, and then I inherit that wealth, it's a blessing to me directly. If they have a reputation and I have respect because of that reputation, then it is something that I have directly. But Sulaiman is asking for the ability to show gratitude for what his parents have it's as if even that independent blessing of the parents has continuity for Sulaiman. And what I'm saying by that is that there is an indication in this wording that if our parents have been blessed, we should consider that our heritage and our legacy. There are many people whom I know, and I'm sure all of you know, who complain about nothing more than that their parents were honorable, spiritual, noble people. They helped everyone in their family and they didn't build up any savings to pass on to us. They got their brothers established, their poor members of the community, whatever else they may do, they volunteered so much to help other people that they weren't able to do all of the things that we want them to do. So this is something that sometimes children, sometimes relatives, we sometimes complain about, rather than say that this is the most beautiful heritage that our parents could build for us. They set an example for how to be a beacon of light for humanity and for our communities. They gave us a good name, and by their good deeds, they made themselves and us worthy of so many blessings in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the eyes of God. 
that will save us from so many calamities and so many hardships because of the blessings of what they have done. Rather than that, we have people who are willing to turn their back or even think negatively of their parents' legacy and their heritage. This is something which we should be very careful not to do. We should not ever turn our back on that legacy and we will return to this concept. But if there is a blessing that Allah has given to our parents, to our ancestors, if they have good practices, customs of charity, of kindness, of goodness within the family, within the community, we should be asking Allah to be able to show gratitude for that. And the way we show gratitude for that is by continuing that legacy and honoring what they have done. So Sulaiman so says, Oh Allah, grant me the ability to show gratitude for their, uh, the blessings you gave to my parents and to me. And that I may do good which is pleasing to you. Actions that are good. So gratitude comes first, and then that gratitude is also not just in word but also in deed, to do good deeds. And cause me to enter in among your righteous servants. As our Mufassirin have said, first Sulaiman asks for the means to succeed and achieve salvation, and then he asks for salvation. So our prayers to Allah are not going to be, Oh Allah, this is my shopping list for paradise. I want an estate blocked in by such a, a beautiful fence, a nice villa with this many trees and this kind of gardens, and I've seen botanical gardens in some city, that's the way I want it to be designed. We don't just ask Allah for what we want in the hereafter, but we ask Allah for the means to show gratitude, and then we ask Allah for the actual blessing in the hereafter. The entire package is what we want from Allah. And in fact, asking Allah for the gratitude, and asking Allah for the ability to do good and that inspiration, is as rewarding, if not more rewarding, than asking Allah for what we want in the hereafter. Because that is the beauty of what it means to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the method by which this prayer is asked. And one final point that I would like to make is that Sulaiman, he says, Adkhilni bi rahmatika fi ibadika salihi. Cause me to enter among your righteous servants. Now this salih actions that Sulaiman is asking for, this refers not just to the action, but to the essence of the person, to have a salih essence. But when he asks to be caused to enter into Allah's righteous servants, first look at the absolute humility that represents. I'm not a king, and I do not have authority over people's bodies let alone over the people, and over jinn, and over animals, and over the wind, as Sulaiman had. And yet, when I have my limited authority, I'm a little bit wealthier than everybody else. I'm a little bit more prestigious than everybody else. I'm a community leader. I'm from a good family, and all of these other things. I don't want to be adkhilni fi ibadika salihin. I want to be on top of Allah's righteous servants. I want to be at the head of the gathering. And in fact, if I am just one of the crowd and one of the community, I feel a little bit offended. So wait a minute, where is my special chair? Where is my throne? Where is my distinction? But here we have a prophet of God given inspiration. The son of a prophet of God and also a king who has physical authority, spiritual authority, and even authority over the kingdom. And his prayer to God is, cause me to enter among your righteous servants. Not above, but among. The absolute humility. And second, it teaches us the value of the company of the righteous. There are many believers and righteous people who say, well, we'll be good. But all of those people in the mosques and all of those people, they're annoying. They take off, and I've heard these things when people go for Hajj or they go to the masjid. They take off their socks, and I don't like the way that that, uh, that, that the feeling that I get in that environment. I, I'm not comfortable. They, I want to stay alone. I feel better that way. The character of the prophets of God and the true believers is to enjoy the company of the righteous and the believers. Of course, in reality, we are asking for the company of the infallibles. Allah's prophets, his chosen people, but also our fellow believers. We're not going to alienate people or separate ourselves because people have some minor faults. 
but instead we seek their company and we take pleasure in the company of our fellow believers. The company of the righteous, that is something that a prophet of God who had everything in this world would ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. And finally, it also tells us that we are not just seeking the concept of righteousness, but we are looking to the righteous themselves to see what they were like in order to be joining their company. If I say to Allah, make me righteous, then it's just the concept of righteousness that I have pictured in my mind, and that's what I'm moving towards. But if I say, oh Allah, make me enter among the people who are righteous, that only works if I have a picture of the people who are righteous, and I'm saying to Allah, make me like them. And so I have that complete picture, I have them as a role model, and then I am moving towards them with all of their attributes, with all of their characteristics. And that is what we as believers are doing. And there is no one more blessed in history to have more perfect role models than those of us who are followers of Ahlul Bayt We have all of the prophets of God, from Adam السلام, through Nuh السلام, Ibrahim, Musa, Isa, to the Prophet of Islam, and his noble successors and progeny, all of them as beautiful role models. When we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with this prayer, picture their character, put it in front of us, and say, Allah, we want to be in their company and we want to have their attributes, their salah and righteousness, and all of their other attributes because they are our role model. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to be like his chosen servants. May Allah cover our shortcomings and our mistakes. May he grant us the ability to show gratitude for what he has given us and to do good deeds that are pleasing to him. And may he give us the company of his righteous servants in this world and in the hereafter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the love and the company of Muhammadu Ali Muhammad in this world and for all eternity in the hereafter. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.